Out on the prairie with no river or fast-moving creek, wind was the power that turned the stones to mill grain. A common feature in Europe, windmills also once dotted the landscape of Illinois. Hi, I'm Jim Wilhelm. Behind me is one of the few remaining windmills in Illinois. It's the only one that still has its original workings and is still grinding grain. In addition, this one has a twin in Germany. In 1852, Henry Immiger immigrated to this area from Germany and built the first of his three mills. He operated the mill until 1863 when he sold it and moved his family back to Germany. It's speculated that his sudden departure was due to the Civil War Conscription Act, the first in our nation's history. That act required not only all male citizens to register, but also all aliens who intended to become citizens. Back in Germany, Henry built his second mill, which he operated until 1872, and then he came back to Golden. By the way, that mill located in Feldy, Germany, is still standing. Using the same plans and construction techniques as in Germany, he built his third and final mill in Golden. Henry remained in the States for five years and then retired to Europe. Afterwards, his son took over the operation. The mill stands 92 feet high. Each sail is 35 feet long and 8 feet wide. When turning in a strong breeze, they can generate up to 75 horsepower. To keep the sails into the wind, the whole top cap can be turned. The process is called winding and involves a capstan and an anchor. Suppose a miller wants to move the cap this way. First thing he does is attach this anchor to the stage. The anchor holds firmly one end of a chain that's wrapped around the capstan wheel. Now by turning the wheel and winding the chain around it, the miller forces the entire cap to move in the direction of the anchor. The cap weighs about 33,000 pounds without sail and it just sits on top of the tower. So that it can be turned easily, a variety of lubricants were tried and failed. What has worked was what was used in the beginning, hog lard. This town was first called Keokuk Junction, but in 1863 the name was changed to reflect the fields of gold and grain growing in the area. Of course the grain required milling, so this was a good place to start a windmill. First because there was usually a steady wind, and secondly because two railroads crossed here, giving the miller access to several markets. Wagons loaded with grain would enter the first bay to be weighed on the scales. Then they would come out, make a U-turn into the second bay where they were unloaded, and then the empty wagon would be weighed again to determine the amount of grain. The grain was brought in by sacks, and we'll see why in a moment. This was a custom mill. That means that the milling done here wasn't done for a large company that bought the grain, but instead was done for individual farmers. Usually at these operations, the miller would take a toll or a portion of the grain for his service. In addition, Mr. Imiga would buy the excess grain not needed for the farmstead, mill it, and sell it under his own brand. The first floor was a crowded and busy place called the meal floor. <coughs> Here, bins under each of the three grinding stones would collect the finished product, which was stored in barrels for shipment. And it was on this floor that sacks came into play. The reason the grain had to be sacked was the way it was transported up to the third floor where the bins are located. Each sack was tied to the hoisting rope and when the operator heard the second trap door shut, he knew the sack had arrived. Above the meal floor is the stone floor where the grinding takes place. This mill has three sets of stones, each assigned for certain kinds of grain. For example, one would have been used exclusively for buckwheat, which is a small, black, oily seed. Each stone weighed about 2,500 pounds, and they were imported from France. 
Only the top or runner stone spun, while below the bed stone remained stationary. And while there were three sets here, only one could be turned at a time. Grain would drop down from bins in the floor above and into the center of the stone. To allow a constant amount of grain to flow into the stone, an agitator shakes the grain shoe so that the stone produces a consistent quality of the flour. Each stone has a pattern of cuts chiseled into the surface that shreds and grinds the grains down into flour and directs it to the outer edges. Inside, a sweeper spins around, pushing the meal to a floor hole that drops it into the bin below for final packaging. The quality of the flour is determined by the space between the stones, which can be adjusted to 1 64th of an inch. As for maintenance, each off-season, the grooves in the stone have to be re-chiseled. From the third floor, where the grain bins once were, visitors can see the great wooden gears and their teeth, which transfer the wind's power to the stones. Today, all the gears and teeth are lubricated with beeswax. In 1924, a violent storm destroyed two of the sails, so the owner installed a gas engine. A few years later, the mill was shut down. After decades of neglect, a group of dedicated volunteers have restored the mill to its current condition. Today, the mill's sails still turn above the farmland it once served, and occasionally the stones still grind away. In addition, one of the wings now houses the collection of the Golden Historical Society. In here are items people have saved for generations, everything from clothing to tools, including this seed spreader made right here in Golden. All one had to do was sit on the back of a horse, flip his arm from side to side. Here's a letter written by President Grover Cleveland dated 1889. Apparently a local lady who was expecting had written to the president for permission to name the new child after him. He, of course, replied in the affirmative. On display is this device that looks more like an electrical nightmare than a beauty aid. For a time, women wanting a perm would have their hair rolled over metal curlers. Then these metal clamps were applied and the electricity was turned on. We're told it got uncomfortably warm under those rollers. Speaking of electricity, here's a vacuum cleaner that doesn't use any. It has a worm gear assembly that works like a child's push toy that's revved up by dragging it across the floor rapidly. These were popular through the 1940s in the rural areas without power. It was here that we learned about the two local boys who went on to play in the major leagues, the Russell brothers. Rick was drafted by the Cubs in 1970, and his brother joined the team later. In fact, they're the only siblings ever to have combined for a shutout. It happened in 1975 when Rick pitched for over six innings, and then his brother Paul, who's a reliever, finished the game for a 7-0 Cub win. Today, the Society's collection is displayed at the foot of Golden's most famous landmark. Now restored, the prairie windmill still grinds grain on occasion, but more importantly, it reminds visitors of the agricultural heritage of this area. The Society offers programs for students which teach about the rural lifestyle of the late 1800s. On occasion, reenactors don period costumes during the tours. The mill is open for tours during the summer and fall. For more information or to schedule a tour, call 217-696-2722 or go to their website at www.goldenwindmill.org.